Oh dear, sorry about that people, but listen, you gotta have a sense of humour, haven't you? Dear oh lord, if you lose that, you've lost everything. So give me five seconds to get set up here, get organised, get the old girl going. Couldn't get the, um, wait for this. Mike's got a shed at his house. He's, I said, where's the hot water heater that you actually boil the water on properly? It's in the shed, but the, the padlock's stuck. Okay, he's probably lost the padlock when it snapped off in the lock. I go round, get a pair of big bolt croppers, crop it off, perfectly good padlock. There's nothing wrong with it, I can see it's freed off. And then I open the door. Oh, he's not there, he's in the garage. And he's not there, so I'm going to have to boil it on my, uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, I did bring my kettle, always bring a kettle. Give me five minutes to get organised and we'll crack on. I'm organised because I've got the fire going. I only had some damp paper in it. I forgot to bring a bit of dry paper and that's why I made those wood shavings. But I do like to bring in, where I can, some dry, really, it's dry in here, but I mean this fire, this cheese stove just eats wood. So if it's been raining, you might have even more trouble lighting the fire. So I bring in all dry wood. If I can pack it in, then if Mike comes in the cabin, anybody turns up in the cabin, well, obviously anybody that turns up that's supposed to be there, um, then at least they've got a dry supply of wood. And I imagine that's pretty much the norm for, if you had a hunting cabin or something like that, is that you make sure there's a good stock of wood in case uh, there's an emergency for anybody. Look, we don't have hunting cabins in the UK, but I know they have them all, all over other countries. And it can be a lifesaver if there's plenty of wood there for other people and it's bone dry that can go underneath right it's getting warm in there boys time to get a little bit unwrapped that fire's going well that's the thing i love about coming in this cabin it is so warm i'm going to give it look at this we're going to give it wrong wrist grab i've had to put it on the other wrist i've got trouble with this uh, left hand so i'll put the watch on the other side one o'clock that's about 10 minutes that's been going and I'm hot already I can tell you there by the uh, it's about 100 degrees in the oven so boys this is a non-fishing film a non-fishing film but with fishing stuff in it so all you that go oh I can't take it I want I want fat carb a lot of older guys out there will recognize some of this tackle the younger people what I'm doing is because they won't have a clue what was used years ago they just go into a tackle shop they're sold whatever the latest and greatest is, they throw it out, hook a fish if they're lucky, wind it in, hey-ho, life's good.
But what did the people of a hundred years ago fish with? I'm going to show you. First, I've got a little tip here I'm going to show you on a cheap feeder while this kettle's boiling because I'll have a cup of tea first and then the throat's all right for talking. And there's plenty of talking to come, plenty of bits of tackle for you. Don't switch off. Just about going to stretch this lead file without pulling the camera crash into the ground. Now, like you guys, this is for freshwater anglers. Use swim feeders, okay? That's better. Right, now a lot of you guys out there use swim feeders and one of the deadliest methods is called the method feeder. So this again for beginners, if you get method feeders, there are various different sort of types of method feeder, but basically what it is is you'd, you'd fill your ground bait mix in here, this plastic pre-shaped uh, mould, okay? Your line would go through the middle of the feeder. This is really basic. In fact, there's a piece of fishing line left. There's a piece of fishing line, and it's what they call carp friendly, because people use them for carp mostly. This will pull free out of that swivel. Well, now I've done it, I've pulled the line right out. So if, if, a fish, if the line does break, it can pull free and it's not carting this around with it. Every time I, I come out, I forget that these are my drivers, so I've got no chance of tying fishing knots without my full binoculars. Oh yes, man, the swim feeder looks about 14 feet wide now. He says, not being able to thread it. So there you can see, there's your fishing line up here. It's pinched in by the swivel in this little rubber sleeve there. You mix your ground bait up here. Your hook link will come off there. Very, very close, normally let's say three or four inches. You can fish them where you want. I know all the experts say, oh, I use, I use six inches, I use one inch. You're doing it wrong. I'm just telling you, roughly for beginners, quite close to the feeder, three to four inches. Okay, so when you've got your ground bait in there, you then push with these loops here like this you push it into the mold to crush it into the ground bait that pre-shapes it when you peel it out you will have a, a basically a little hump or ball of ground bait there along comes mr fish nibble 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 now it's almost like a bolt rig so when he picks his bait up here he goes what the hell's that tug tug bolts and that is when you get a bite on your bite alarm or if you're quiver tipping your quiver tip goes around generally fish is a quiver tip i guess um, they've got a grip on the bottom to, well, I suppose for rivers if you want to use them on a river. So there you go, that's a, well, what do we say, a shop bought traditional method feeder. But how about the guy that made these? How clever is this? How about, how about making a plastic golf ball, a practice one this is, a drive, well, it's not even a driving range one, it's a plastic, uh, has a, a air holes in it. He's cut it in half there, okay, he's cut it in half. He's put a piece of pipe in through there. He's glued a bit of weight in there. He's written on there five, so I guess that's five grams. The guy sent us these, all homemade. That one's got 25 written on it there, like that. So, yeah, I know it's heavier. 20, I guess 25 grams. Grams mean nothing to me, because I come from old school. Quarter an ounce, I'm gonna call that. Uh, you could do the same principle. You could, you, could, you could have this very close. You squeeze your ground bait into here and around it, and because it's got all these holes, it grips it, and then you cast out and keep your bait well, fairly close to the ground bait ball. When the fish comes along, you investigate it. And because these being with the weight just there in the bottom, they sink down, whoosh. I've used these in a caught fish to film yet, it's going to come out. Don't worry, I've done it, did it last year. Sinks to the bottom, sits the right way up with the ground bait on the top, okay? So when they nibble away here, they can see the hook bait is very close. So how simple is that? There is a shop ball version here is i think really good guys taking a lot of trouble to make these and you can make so many like this can't you? you can make so many so there you go there's a little tip for you the kettle is about to take off totally with steam so i feel i'm going to have a cup of tea and then we'll get cracking on the uh, on the tackle i want to show you from yesteryear there we go that's out that is definitely steaming away. Now then, let's get myself ready. Cup, cup. Everybody be careful now. Watch this, people. Watch this, people. Watch this. Uh, tea bag. Now, I'm going to undo my little folding unit here. Sugar. Oh, go on. Okay. Now then. Here comes the moment of truth. 
Ready? I, I can't bring myself to do it. I can't bring myself to do it because of the comments, the shocking comments in the last film. <laughs> Don't you ever, ever think, I only did it for a joke, I put in milk in before the tea bag goes in, so there it goes, people. Keep that shut down. So, well, this one is brewing or infusing. I cannot tell you the shock and horror when, when I tell people I could think I'm going to put the milk in or something before. There were people like this, you know, just nodding off, just nodding off, half dozing, half watching what I was saying in that last film. And then they were, then they were like, Mabel, Mabel, coming here, love. There's only a bloke going to put some milk in before he puts tea in. Mabel, get out from under those logs, love. Come and see what this bloke's doing. Well, you know why, don't you, Mabel? Aye, he's a southerner. He's going to do something stupid like that. Well, here I'm doing it the right way around. Going to put my milk in, have a cup of tea. We're going to get some ro ro not rods out. We'll get rods out. Going to get some reels out and talk about them. It's really hot, it's really hot. Now, when I consider that the tea bag has infused, I will be adding... Please don't have a go at me. It's, it's, I can't even say it's... It's, it's skim milk. Mabel is only going to put... It's put skim milk in there, love. I mean, you should be using full cream. I put skim milk in my tea, trying to stay healthy. And then of course I have particles of dirt off of the spoon. So for all the people out there that, <gasps> everything must be so squeaky clean. No, not with me, I'm a fisherman. That was hot. Right, let's get a couple of rules out and show you. Right, I'm gonna leave my readers on because I can see stuff. Let's get this on another swig of tea. Hmm. Okay, let's call it about 100 years ago, long time in fishing terms. Fishermen were still catching fish. They were still using tackle. Originally, one assumes bows and arrows and spears, possibly then nets after the Stone Age, and then poles with bits of hair, horse hair on, and fishing close in. Then they want to fish further out where well, you need a reel to get more line. One of the early reels that was very popular, very popular with people, is this one. It's wood and brass. Okay, it has a clicker on the back like this and it's called a star back. See, it's got a star on the back which supports the wood plate, supporting plate. All brass, all brass, you wouldn't get it probably nowadays with brass. It'd be very expensive to make. So that's all it was. It's what we call direct drive. There you go one to one, forwards and backwards, and the fish pulling line out this, you would palm it. You wouldn't, if it span fast and went like this, you would get what's called a knuckle wrapper. This would be whizzing around, and you go to grab it, and it'll hit your knuckles, called a knuckle wrapper. Oh yeah, I know what I'm gonna tell you guys about. I'll tell you about this after I've talked about this reel. So here's a wooden Starbuck. Starbuck? <laughs> a Starbuck reel? Sure it's not a Costa Coffee reel, Graham. Okay, it's a star, Starbuck reel. Okay, there's a star back of it. What drag you could apply was via a wing nut here. There, you could put a little bit of drag on there. You can make it very, very free. This one's not really been oiled, very free. Or you could do it down quite tight and you know, get yourself a little bit more drag. Not much, not much in fairness. The clicker was here. Somebody's put brass bolt on there. So you can just hear the clicker. Now, you'll notice I'm gonna say this is for a right-handed user because the ratchet inside is smooth this way put it there you'll hear it and noisier that way more drag if that makes sense so that is the wooden starback reel a very early one very popular not worth a lot of money nowadays but that was a traditional fishing reel of the anglers of yesteryear now this is what i was going to tell you i'll put that one there people sometimes ask us it's a great fishing show why do these people dislike it? Well, the dislikers, it really doesn't bother me whether they hit the like or they don't hit the like. I'm, I'm going to make the films anyway. 
The problem is, people get abusive on there and they swear. So why do they? Why would you bother swearing? What have I? What have I done? Have I shot your dog or something? Why would you do that? You, you just like maybe what I'm saying. Fine, that's okay. Let's have, you know, a sensible question, possibly with all the letters in the right order. But they start swearing, so we remove them. Then they come back and have another go. So we remove them. Then they have another go, and we remove them. After a while, you go remove block. That means they've got to set up a whole new account if they want to have another go on YouTube. So. All I do is click, remove, click, block, job done. They're gone. Okay. This one is a brass flywheel. So that's more expensive. And it says, third pair of glasses on, strangle self with microphone wire. <laughs> Charles Farlow, maker. Oh yes, 191 The Strand, London. Now, any more writing on it? No. But if one is purchasing one of these said reels, in the Strand London, it will be of extra fine quality. And indeed, this chap is. This one is solid brass. Very nicely made. A nice, I'm going to call that like a bone handle. I don't know what you collectors out there tell us. Like a bone handle, very, very, very smooth gearing. And again, look, the drag is on the reverse if the fish was pulling the line out. So you're winding like this. Do it here so you can hear on the micro. This on the, on the microphone. This way. Very, very quiet because you're retrieving your line or fly. And when the fish will pulls line out, you cannot touch the rim like you can on the Starbuck here. It's enclosed, it's encased. So you can't, uh, short of grabbing the line and going, crack. Obviously, there's no pressure. So you would let the heavy duty ratchet here, the drag, pull on the fish. You just sort of let go, wind when you can. And as the fish pulls up and goes away, you release the handle and the heavy drag there will give you your pressure for playing the fish. So very nice reel there. Similarly, slightly larger, I would suggest this one might not be so expensive. How many, how many, <laughs> it's alive. All right, this one, this one's an unusual one, Alfred and Son Makers. My goodness me, it's 20 Moorgate Street, London. Now these are the makers. No, I don't think these are the sellers, these are the manufacturers. So they made these fishing reels in London for the Trout Fishing Fraternity. That looks like brass, but it's got a strange sort of anodizing colour around the side of it there. Again, now that seems twin ratchet, so maybe this was the first of the left and right hand ambidextrous winds ratchets. You could use it either way. Right, what else have we got in the goodie bag? I'm going to go to the other end of the scale. I'm having a fry up in a minute, boys. Oh, yes. It's going to be bacon and egg sandwich, and I am starving. It takes ages to make these films. People don't realise it, really. Right. People out there who are dyed in the wool, long distance beach casters, I can cast 140 yards with a half ounce of lead pole. Fine. I don't know whether you actually catch any fish, but for the long distance casters, with the latest and greatest in reels, Years ago, I've got to call it 80 years ago, you needed one of these. That's right. This is a traditional beach wheel. It's called a Scarborough. Okay. It's all machined out of one piece of wood. I don't think that's joined at all. That's one piece of wood. They have here, again, that wing nut on the back. I don't know if I can free that a bit. But these ones, you would get a big retrieve. Look at the size of the retrieve you would get there, winding in, because you had to to get your fish and all your terminal gear back up over the rocks. And believe it or not, they used to get these. This one's not. This one's not running smoothly. I haven't oiled it, obviously. This one, you could spin this like a giant center pin. This must be eight inches across, I would guess, something like that. For a brass uh, shaft and reel seat here. So this would be oiled in there, and I think that would free off a little bit as well, as well as the back. I can't get it right off. No, it needs to be done with a little pair of pliers and some WD-40 then oiled. So this will be cast really hard, and this would be what's called the original knuckle wrapper. When you cast really hard, this used to revolve at a tremendous rate, and you would cast, look, you're not going to cast, I don't imagine, a hundred and something yards with it, but this was the first of the early beach casting reels. It's called a wooden Scarborough reel, and that's from up in Yorkshire where they used to fish off uh, off the shore there. And it did get popular down the south. People did use it off of piers and stuff like that, because look, different line capacity. So you can see how things have changed 
from the wooden Starbuck like this. Starbuck, I've got it again. I don't even, I don't even drink coffee. That's the thing. I don't drink coffee. Starbuck reel. There, and you can see how the diameters have changed. Right, let's move on. I'm going to put this one there. I like the look of this one. Well, I like wood. That's why it's nice to see some wood, isn't it? You know, stand them all up in a row. They look pretty, like little soldiers. Attention! If you were going salmon fishing, you would require a larger version of the trout design, and you would get wall up one of these great big heavy ones. The manufacturers are for those avid collectors out there and connoisseurs of fine tackle. It says on here, J. Bernard and Son, Makers, 45 German Street, St. James, South West London. So it's a London one. But the reason I bought this one, no other writing on it, it's sort of brass and like an anodized uh, material. Okay, so, oh God, needs a bit of oil. So again, what we call direct drive, one turn this way, one turn the other way. But just up here, hopefully you can see this, if I, again, you can't rim control this because the rim is inside that cage, but it's got like a button on the top. So if you can imagine, there's the rod, the fish is pulling away like this. You would bring your left hand round here and you could pinch on that. Maybe your right thumb, thinking of it, you don't get knuckle wrappers, your right thumb on that button there. And that absolutely locks the spool. Look, I can't move it. I've only got to press it out a little bit. So you could actually let a fish go and then you want to break it. Press the button, stopped. So that, I don't have many of these. I used to have a big collection of tackle. I sold it all at auction. Don't know why, I probably should have kept it, kept moving it around in boxes. And I think I thought, do you know what? I've had this stuff 30 years and it's still in the boxes. There's no point. You want collectors to enjoy it and at least preserve them. So there you go. That's got the original, of the, I would call that the first type of brake or drag system that we know today. Very, very big, takes a lot of line because salmon are much bigger fish. Gonna have to go for that uh, bacon and eggs in a minute. Do you realise, people, I'm the only presenter that is forgotten that he's still wearing two pairs of glasses. God, those reels are big. Oh, that's better. So, from these early brass ones, okay, which are heavy, life has progressed through the fishing world as it does. And if you'll notice there, the spool is attached by centre screws on all of these. Every one is a centre screw in there, okay? So now the tackle industry have moved on a pace. And a little bit later, this one is manufacturer's name, star date. Looks like JJS Walker Bampton and Co. I think it is. Ormwick. So there is an area of Ormwick was famous for making fishing tackle. It's still got the original flax on it. <laughs> String, cotton, wax thread, egg yolk. It is waxed. I can feel the wax in this, to be honest. This would have been dry fly fishing, a trout reel for dry fly fishing. And there is very, very, very stiff, wiry fly line. That's the equivalent of the fly line that we have today with all the plasticizing components over it, make it so soft and supple. Can you imagine fishing with something like a demented clock spring here? But they did, and they caught fish. The thing I wanted to point out to you here is they've made this out of a different metal to make it lighter because you're fly fishing all day. So they've made it lighter. They've also made, this is one of the first ones, a little lever here which disengages so you have a removable spool. So the angler could then put two spools rather than take all the line off. He had easy access to the spool, take it off, get another spool on there, one with a floating uh, line and one with a sinking line. So you can see how the tackle industry had moved forward then. Must make sure I don't pinch that line in there when I close it. Pop. Right, now what I'm going to do... Ah, oh, that's interesting. This comes off the top of the line of the spool there. So if I was a right-handed, left-hand wind, I'd want to go that way. I'm actually unwinding it. So that tells me the angler was a left-handed caster. A left-handed man. He's a left-handed man. There we go. Now... I'm going to put my bacon and eggs on and then we will finish showing you some other very, very unusual and old bits of reels.
Right, it appears that the said frying pan is about to explode. We'll know by the sound of this. Yes, that's very hot. Put some bacon in there to cool it off. I'm going to give myself a bacon sandwich. There's no point doing my tackle talk and showing you bits and pieces in here without making use of this wonderful stove. I'm going to tune that as low as, as, low as I can get it. So everything okay? The candles are not going to combust in the solo off-grid cabin. This bacon is going to get cooked pretty quickly on this heat and I've got that I've got that stove shut right down. I mean these things, if you made yourself one of these cabins, look, if you one regret I probably do have would be years ago I probably could have easily bought a lake or maybe a stretch of river or something like that. And nowadays they're like stupid money and there's hardly any fish. Is it just I wish I'd done that and now I could have had a nice cabin like this there with a stove in there. And you can stop fishing, you can you know, make tea. I can do everything in this. Look, look the oven there. What's that? 150 degrees. I'm not even using it. I'm going to try and make a bit of toast in there when I get this uh, towards cooking more. If only you guys could smell this cooking bacon. Just something about cooking outdoors. It's really quite, and it actually does take, taste good on an open fire, I must admit. Right, I'm going to let that work away there. Then I'm going to have an egg in there. Cheers, Graham. Hmm, not a bad cup of tea. He still used skim milk there, Mabel. Don't take any notice of him. Don't trust him. You're in there somewhere, aren't you, Chuck? You're down under there, aren't you? Now, people out there, I've been in trouble with the tea bags. Putting milk in with the tea before the tea's brewed. Should I flip that egg or should I not flip that egg? I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do. But do you guys like your egg sunny side up or over easy, I believe? This one's called, if it's over easy, if it goes over it be something. It's over. Might be over broken. We're getting close. I think I've failed on the toast. It's going to be warm bread, but listen, it's dropped to 100 and something. Because I've tuned the fire down, otherwise I'm going to burnt bacon. Well, boys, I think we're going to have to go with the uh, with the warm bread. It is toasting, but I probably put it in. Oh no, it's starting to go. It is starting to go. Notice I placed a hole there so the egg runs through there. This oven is very, very good, but there you go. It is starting to toast. I don't think I've got it hot enough, to be honest. So here we go. Fire off. Egg on. I'm not going to get all this bacon on there. I have to eat some of it separately. Who likes a nice bacon sandwich? Oh, oh. <laughs> it's all going, folks. Now here comes a point. Here comes a point. I normally would have toast and put yes Mabel he's only gonna put the artificial stuff on there now would you have butter on it no butter or one of these alleged healthy spreads I don't know what this one's called clover or something lovely I mean you would never when you put that on toast you would never think folks of eating that in one chunk would you in fact why do we put it on bread so would you guys use artificial stuff we're gonna call it or would you use regular butter on there? And worse, I don't know if I can do it. Mabel, I've seen where he's got in his hand. It's not brown sauce. It, oh no, it's only red sauce. You never have red sauce with bacon. I'm going to put it on, I'm going to put it on, guys. I can't help it. The wife couldn't find it. I like brown sauce. I know it sounds daft. I like brown sauce with sausages. And red sauce with bacon. Tomato sauce. Here we go. In fact, basically, it's tomato ketchup with a side 
side out order of bacon. Beautiful. Cut with a very, very sharp knife that's probably gone through the tablecloth and the wood. Do I care? Not one jot because it's all going home. Wash that later. Here we go, here we go. Almost toast, look at that. Guys, bacon and egg sandwich. Mmm. <laughs> Mmm. We'll be right back after this bacon sandwich. Right, boys, I'm back. Suitably refreshed, I hasten to add. Okay, moving on from those different types of reels, here's another one. We're moving forwards with different types of techniques of casting now. This one, a brass one, heavy brass one, used a lot for salmon fishing. But then I believe it sort of transpired that the pike anglers would use them. Anybody with, say, a biggish bait that needed a cast. Okay, this is called a mallock. And if I can find... Oh my God, I've lost my glasses. Has anybody ever lost their glasses? And then they need a pair of glasses to see where they've lost their glasses. Right, let's see what this one says. I know it's going to say mallocks, but... Mallocks patent. So this was a fairly, I'm going to call it, sort of cheaper version of its time. Very, very heavy. Okay, so... You can see it's got the winder here, same thing. You know, you can wind forwards and backs. There's no, um, is that a ratchet on there? No, I don't think it is on that one. But the but the benefit of the casting with this one, you think, how do I cast it? What's this big loop with a circle on the front there? Well, this simply just would turn on a hinge against that there. You would cast off like this. So you can imagine, here's the line. I'll put it through the loop. We're getting towards what we know as Fixed ball or spinning wheels, aren't we? You can see that. Can you see that, guys? I'm hoping you're getting all this. I don't know with this little camera really what it gets. So there you go. You'd be winding. Very stiff, this one. You'd be winding, obviously not backwards, like this. Then when you want to cast, you would turn it sideways. And look how easily it comes off there. Look. It's just coming off the edge of this ball. Now, this doesn't have any form of oscillation system to line lay up there, does it? It doesn't have that oscillation system that you guys the you know, youngsters amongst you, i.e. under 50, know about. That's what they do, it spreads the line. This one didn't have it, so there's no real way of spreading the line that I know other than moving your hand side to side on that width of that ring there. So there you go, that's a mallet. That's a side casting reel that they call a side. There's another one called an Alvey, which is a lot later, but you can see how it's got this, that, if I just show you there, it's a real heavy duty what is that? It's not a spring, is it? What's the name? You engineering guys out there, watch how that works. See it? To lock it in position. What do they call that type of spring? I don't know. I call it everything a spring that locks. Still working, probably a hundred years old, solid brass. So now we're getting on towards slightly more modern fishing reels. Okay. What about this one then? That is some weird creature, isn't it? That's a weird creature. Now this one, I know it's called a Stanley, but I could put my glasses on trying to uh, get you guys the exact name of it. All the collectors know, oh yes, it's done so. Yeah, we know you know. Beginners don't. This one is an Alcock Stanley reel. Patent number. The reason I bought this one is you can see the line, there's a tiny little spool or bobbin holder, if you like, there. You would, you would wind like this, right? But listen, how can I describe this? If you look at that spool, we just mentioned about you can't spread the line on the spool. If you look along here, there's obviously some form of worm screw, worm screw that relates to the cogs inside this main wheel here. So just watch this little hook here. If I can hold it, it's difficult not being on a rod. Watch that. Can you see that moving, guys? Can you see how that is one of the original first sort of line lays, spreading the line up and down the spool like that, which this big one, the mallock, didn't have, did it? So you can see how we're sort of progressing, and people are now, this is obviously a freshwater reel. I'm guessing it's a worm screw action, somebody tell me, who's taking these apart. That actually spreads a line, and would be, I believe, one of the first oscillation systems. Moving on. Yes, we're getting there now, guys. Now, you would recognize that, you youngsters, as a fishing reel. This one is, so, by appointment to the late King George V, 
and the Prince of Wales, blah, 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 19... I'm going to say 1931, it's so small on this one. This is by Hardy Brothers Limited, Ormwick, England, and it's called the Hardex Reel. Okay, so now that has a fixed bail arm here, you know, it, it doesn't open like our modern ones do, but it does in fact swivel here. So I'm guessing when you cast out, you would cast like this, and then the line would pick up on that as it closed, you see? It would pick the line up, and then when you wound in, you've already got the oscillation gearing system inside here, not the worm screw that this one had, inside there, the big gear in there, and that, as you can see, spreads the line up and down as you wind in. So that's probably the forerunner of the fixed spool or spinning wheel. Is that mic on? Yes. As we know it today. I thought that was an interesting one to show you as well. And of course, all the time, we're getting away from the brass and we're getting towards lighter materials. Finally, you've got a drag system now on the front. You see the spool revolving like that. You have a little, well, I haven't got totally away from brass, it's there. You can close that down and put more and more pressure on that spool. Yeah, that's tight now. Pinch it right down. So that's the first type of graded drag system on a, I'm going to call it a fixed spool because this is a fixed spool because the spool is fixed and the arm and the outside casing is a bit that goes up and down, laying it like a bobbin. Now, if you were requiring these, these aren't in working order, well they're in working order but you wouldn't want to fish with them, you had to oil them. And just look at this, I got actually an original old bottle of oil. This one's an American one, it's called Fluger. I know it starts with a P, PF is the start of Fluger, they made tackle and reels etc. That's the original oil, still in there. I have not, uh, you know, un well, I've done it. I don't know what it smells like, probably smells of oil. And it's got, it smells of fish oil, actually. It smells a bit fishy. Somebody who's a collector, tell us, is that some fish-based oil in there? I want to say it is. And of course, it's got like a, a wire stem there. Can you see that? To, that you would obviously put a heavy amount on there. See the drip on the end of that? Mind you, there's a drip holding the bottle. <laughs> oh, it's very, very, there it goes, drip. And that's obviously how you applied it. So that one is a real oil for the reels of yesteryear. I could re even read some of that with six pairs of glasses on. Fluger, speedy real oil, number 379. Highly recommended for oiling guns, clocks, typewriters, sewing machines, and all precision instruments and machinery. Will not gum or corrode become rancid or evaporate and is proof against rust. As music my ears, the kettle's on the go again. I'm up for the second brew. So, because it used the word in there, rancid, I'm going to say that's oil, fish oil based. Some of you collectors out there, tell me. Finally, well, it's not finally on this one. I've got one beauty to show you at the end, but I'm going to get another brew on first. I've got an original look, case of oil there. How beautiful is the machinery and workmanship on that? I'm going to call that tinned along there, along that edge, just there. It's a beautifully made little oil bottle with a, with a thread on the end, so fine I can't tell you. It's like a watch. I don't suppose there's any oil in there? There's not. And it has slight doming on the outside so you can actually... I'll put it there, you might be able to hear it. And each one of those, you, you think it's just a can. No, it's not just a can. It's slightly bowed so that when you let the oil run down to here, you've got some space there to squeeze and pop in. And each time you push in, it pushes the oil down. So that's an original. I don't believe I've seen one that's got that thread on there like that, other than this one I've got. So a beautiful little piece of uh, antique fishery, fishery stuff, collectibles. Let's get that kettle on. And indeed, the milk is going in after the tea bag has infused. That's better. Right, this is my final main reel. The collectors are going, oh my God, oh my God, he's got one. I used to have several of these in a triangular box. This I think was considered to be the turning point between old fishing reels and modern fishing reels. Yes, it's an Illingworth. Now then, 
I told you about looking for glasses and I'm wearing them. Before I take it out and extract it, I will read you what it says. It says in the original print. Caution! The spool must never, when reassembling, be mounted separately. The ratchet will should, in red, first be attached to the spool and the wheel turned with the fingers till the point of the parallel and the teeth of the wheel properly engage. The spool and ratchet together are then replaced in one piece. This is, and it has a lovely little slot there, you can see that, there's a little slot that you can actually slide the reel seat onto, can you see that guys, as it comes out like that? There's, there's, it's almost leather, it's like cardboard, leather cover, leather, what is it, leather? I think it is leather. Now this one is really a beautiful piece of machinery. Look, I can I barely move it. It has, as you can see by the spool there, oscillation going up and down. Can't you can see the oscillation there? The gearing is exposed at the back there, so it's a very, very old one. But this was a classy piece of equipment. It revolves on the handle here, which is either maybe bone, I don't know, but something like bone. Very, very smooth. You have a graduated system with little dots. I don't want to break this one, where you move around here, I'm guessing to give you increased drag pressure in those little notches, little holes there. Can you see that moving? And it says on the front, so the collectors know it is an original. It's called an Illingworth number three casting wheel. Casting, so it's better for casting. Patent number la di da di da. Off on for the drag. I'm called it drag. I wonder what they called it years ago. USA, and this one is called number 6243, and the date on this, 1916. That is an old fishing reel. As you can see, there's a little loop that you would put your fishing line into, which would be the bay line that we know today. We just loop in there and go back out. You take it off, cast out like normal, then bring it back around that tiny little piece there, so that when you wound in, it went around and around the spool like this, just like a bobbin. And more important, it went up and down and from the back. You can see that oscillation that we talked about, which gives you that line lay going up and down. So really, that's my sort of finest old piece. I almost like the box better than I like the reel, as daft as it sounds. It just slots and hangs in there. It supported hanging at the top there. It's totally enclosed, but I have one more monstrous reel to show you. How would you guys like to go fishing with this baby one? This one will be put on the bottom of a rod with two screw holes, just there. And that actually has on it, I use this for one of our films, and I caught fish. This is horsehair, three strands of horsehair. And I filled the reel up, and I've done a film on our site fishing with horsehair. And you can see it's just one to one, baby miniature reel. I don't think there's any names on that. If there is, there's no way I'm ever going to see it. It is indeed called an Oryx. O R Y X, or it could be a. No, it looks like Oryx. I'm wondering, seeing that, if somebody's drilled those holes there because there's a patent number or something just on one side and they're slightly missing the O of Oryx. So maybe I'll be wrong, maybe it is a real seat that we know today and was clamped on and somebody's found it moved so they got screw holes in it. But there you go collectors, a tiny miniature fishing wheel in solid brass, all the caging intact and the handles. And that's what they started to fish with years ago. So all you people with modern fishing gear now, take a look at some of this that I've been talking about and it gives you a really good insight into what people fish with years ago how tough must it have been of course there was a lot more fish around then loads more fish and of course less people fishing i guess they had poachers then but they wouldn't have had commercials they wouldn't have had people stealing fish you know on the other hand would they have had lots of waters that were stocking fish probably not probably all wild fish that's my gut feeling a hundred years ago mostly all wild fish so there you go guys i hope you've enjoyed in this pallet cabin the world famous pallet cabin millions of views guys on one of the films it's i think over five million views made by myself and mike 
all just reclaimed pallet wood. Every single bit is reclaimed, 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 reclaimed. Junk, junk, junk. Yes, it's still here over two years later. We hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to see more of these in here, let me know because it's, it, it, I find it great fun. I come in here with that stove. Once I get that stove going, it's really good in here. So let me know if you uh, if you do want to see anything like this. Again, I'll do another talking. I'll find something to talk about. <laughs> I have no problem talking fishing because I've been doing it for about 60 years. Don't forget, hit the subscribe button on both channels. That's TA Fishing and TA Outdoors. If you want the merch, there's the merch. Oh dear, there's the key. If you want merch, Mike's got that. He deals all with that. I don't deal with any of that. And uh, we'll see you next time. It could be fishing, could be in the cabin. Let us know, because I know there's been a lot of comments on this cabin series. It's been great fun doing it. I know a lot of you guys out there have enjoyed it. I know a lot of you, what I call proper fishermen, would appreciate this type of thing. We'll see you again next time, and hopefully get some fish in another film as well. So there you go guys, I hope you've enjoyed in this pallet cabin, the world famous pallet cabin, millions of views guys, on one of the films it's I think over 5 million views. Made by myself and Mike, all just reclaimed pallet wood, every single bit is reclaimed, 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 junk, junk, junk. Yes it's still here over two years later. We hope you've enjoyed it, if you want to see more of these in here, let me know, because it's I find it great fun. I come in here with that stove. Once I get that stove going, it's really good in here. So let me know if you uh, if you do want to see anything like this. Again, I'll do another talking. I'll find something to talk about. <laughs> I have no problem talking fishing because I've been doing it for about 60 years. Don't forget, hit the subscribe button on both channels. That's TA Fishing and TA Outdoors. If you want the merch, there's the merch. Oh dear, there's the key. If you want merch, Mike's got that. He deals all with that. I don't deal with any of that. And uh, we'll see you next time. It could be fishing, could be in the cabin. Let us know, because I know there's been a lot of comments on this cabin series. It's been great fun doing it. I know a lot of you guys out there have enjoyed it. I know a lot of you, what I call proper fishermen, would appreciate this type of thing. We'll see you again next time, and hopefully get some fish in another film as well.